Uh, I was going to ask, how did you and Dimitri meet? I didn't see that in the brief history. I just saw that you guys ended up teaming up, but how did you guys initially um, come in contact? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so I saw GitLab on Hacker News when it was a year old. I thought, wow, this is amazing. I'll start GitLab.com because no one was doing something like that. I did a show Hacker News with that. And I sent an email off to Dimitri like, hey, thanks, thanks for making GitLab. I'm using it. I'm going to start gitlab.com and I'm not, I'm not inclined. You're not, you're not going to get any remuneration for this. I'm not going to pay you anything, but uh, thanks anyway. And he sent an email back. No, no, that's fine. You don't have to pay me anything. It's open source and great that you're making it more popular. So I thought that was a good attitude. And that's an attitude that we always try to remember when, for example, Perforce bundled GitLab with their product and never, never be, it's okay. It's open source. No, no one owes us anything. And um, then a year later, Dimitri tweeted out of the blue, I want to work on GitLab full-time just to the whole world, even though he was employed. And I saw that, I'm like, well, we should probably make that happen. I, I got some uh, really large enterprises running GitLab that approached me whether I could add new features to it. So you can probably, I can pay you and then you can add the new features. And that's how we got started with GitLab Enterprise Edition. Were you working at a, uh, a company at the time, Sid, or were you, what, what were you doing? It says Ruby programmer. Yeah, I was a Ruby on Rails uh, developer at a company called Digidentity. They make uh, the single sign-on system for the uh, Dutch government. How has a mentorship played a role in your growth and success um, since coming on to GitLab? Um, of course, there's uh, great bosses in, in your in, in my in my in my career. I think one of the more memorable ones was one when I was super depressed. I had one of my worst bosses. It was a Procter and Gamble. After that, I got one of my best bosses. His name's Artu Boss, and I uh, greatly admire him for lots of attributes that I'm not very good at, like patience. Uh, and, um, for GitLab, a seminal, the, the biggest thing was joining Y Combinator and kind of getting a roadmap of like, okay, if, if you want to go for the top prize, this, this is how you do it. And it's actually a possibility. Um, and right now, I'm, I still have a lot of people that kind of help us. The, the board comes to mind, the board members, there's some advisors, uh, but I also have a CEO coach called John Ham and, uh, that's the person I rely on the most for, for kind of coaching and mentoring. Thinking back about the Y Combinator experience, why did we participate in, in the 25, 2015 batch? Um, and what was the most valuable thing that either you or GitLab learned or took away from that experience? Yeah, thanks, great question. Um, the, we saw that companies were going to consolidate. They were going to either consolidate on an Atlassian stack or GitHub stack or on GitLab. And we know that if we weren't fast enough, if we weren't out there with salespeople, with, with marketing, then it wouldn't be GitLab. And, and GitLab would kind of go away as a project. Okay. The beginning of an industry, you have a thousand flowers bloom, you have all these car manufacturers, and then it consolidates. And we wanted to, to make sure everyone consolidated on, on GitLab and not on other ones. So we knew to do that, we had to go faster. We knew that Y Combinator was the best place to do it. And we learned lots of things, but I, I think the, the most important thing was like iteration and, and the speed that comes with that. Um, at, at, <laughs> at, um, Y Combinator, they, they said, like, what's your growth goal? And we read the literature and we read it's required to do 10% per week. So we said 10% and they knew that we didn't really think about it. So they just doubled our, they said, no, you're going to do 20% a week. And we walked out of that meeting like 20% per week. And we had to be back in like two weeks. That means 40% growth in two weeks. Like, that's impossible. So we kind of give it a half-assed effort. And then uh, we came back two weeks later. And then everyone else in the room had done a stellar job. They, they worked really hard and they, they took, they kind of took shortcuts, but they got it done. 
And we looked at each other and we're like, oh my goodness, everyone is so much better. I, I remember vividly after me was the founder of uh, Campus Job. And she was amazing. She knew all her numbers. So I, I, I got my turn citing what we did and the numbers and what we achieved. And then afterwards it was her, they kind of looked at me and they pointed at her like, this is how you do it. And we felt, oh shit, we have to do a much better job. And uh, we started shipping and we just thought, okay, how can we improve downloads 40%? Like, we don't know, like, okay, well, at least we can make it easier to download and we can probably user test it a bit and we can write an interesting blog post and et cetera. And you just get going. Uh, one guy stayed behind in the Netherlands, uh, Jakob Vosmaar. And he was like, what's happening to these people there? Like, is, is it like pressuring you too much or, or what's, what's happening? And everyone was back to him like, no, no, this is the new normal. This is how things are done here. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, the spirit we have to keep. Like they say there, the only companies that fail is kind of the companies that stop shipping. So that's from me, you always see an emphasis. Okay, what's the smallest possible thing? And can you do it like tomorrow or next week? Get it done, get it out there, and then build on that. Uh, if you lose that, you lose, you lose speed. And, and a startup, the difference between a startup and a regular company is a startup is based on growth. And growth comes from speed. And speed comes from small iterations, quickly done, fast decision making. So I actually had a question related to that, un unrelated to the history. Um, one thing I've noticed, uh, so I've been here for almost four weeks now. Um, one thing I've noticed working remote is compared to my previous job where I was in an office with people, I feel like um, I had a better sense of um, how quickly I was moving or like my, my pace. And so my, I think my question is around, um, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm iterating and I'm trying to, to push things out. But I have like no sense of, is this, uh, I guess it could always be faster, but is it, is it going too slow? Is it, um, you know, on average for my peers? It's like, I have no sense of uh, how to maybe compare myself um, or to, to benchmark, like how quickly I'm, I'm delivering. Uh, so that's kind of what my question is at. Yep. Taylor, thanks for the question. Uh, I think your situation is, is not typical. Uh, for everyone else, Taylor is a data scientist on the, on the BizOps project. And that's new project. So it's really hard to kind of gouge what the, what the goals are week by week. Um, but it's, I, I, the problem is certainly there. Um, I think we can do a better job setting expectations for everyone in the project. I think in the beginning, we were kind of stumbling along, figuring out what the project really was and what we wanted to do. I think now that that's cleared up, um, I know for this week, we're all looking forward to uh, implementing uh, the analytics tool that, we, that we're that we thinking about. So um, that would be the goal for this week. And we kind of, uh, there's kind of a goal for Brian every, from meeting to meeting. Let's make sure we also have a goal for you. And that's, uh, that's, that's on me. So thanks for asking. Can you talk more about the, uh, the culture of remote employees and and you're thinking behind that of, uh, was that the strategy from the start when you um, started GitLab um, or did it kind of morph into that? Yeah, thanks, Tony. Uh, it wasn't a strategy from the start. Um, it's not a very boring solution. It's actually interesting. So it doesn't really fit with our values. Um, the thing is, it was just Dimitri was in the Ukraine. I was in the Netherlands, so we did it like that. And then uh, the first employee was Madden. He lived in, uh, he moved to Amsterdam, I think pretty early and he could come by and work from my place we had two desks next to each other but he kind of stopped bothering at a certain point i was like am i going to tell him to come in i'm like no, I, I don't mind either um so it worked like that and then after we left y combinator we uh I, we know that a lot of organizations have engineering remote but not sales and marketing so we said okay so sales and marketing are going to be uh, on site. So we hired this place where I'm in now, we put in nine desks and uh, uh, but people stopped showing up for work. Um, so uh, Hayden McKay, our, our, our regional director, like he was welcome, like he knew that there was an office, he came the first two days and then one day he didn't show up. And, 
uh, we're a remote company because we didn't have a rule that you had to show up at the office. And I, I, I strongly believe one of our values is results. Uh, so not input. So I don't care whether you show up off the office or not. I, I care that you get done what, what, what we achieved and, and hopefully a bit more. Um, so that it follows from that, just not caring about the input. And I also felt a bit like if people need to show up at the office to keep up to date, like I probably doing something wrong. Like I should probably write a bit more down, or record a bit more, et cetera. I had a kind of follow up question about results there. Um, one thing I kind of find hard to decipher is the concept of a company caring only about your results and how that can kind of, how that can relate to people being potentially overworked as, as out of fear that they're not producing the right results. So like not giving people clarity on what having good results means um, or producing enough work means. So particularly for like new engineer, as a new engineer of the team, I kind of, it's pretty hard to benchmark what I think looks like, what success looks like for me. So um, whereas at least if I was at a company working closely with my peers, it was kind of pretty easy for me to get a good indication that I was contributing well, um, being so disconnected, it's, it's quite difficult. And I, I, I worry that that kind of leads potentially some people to be overworked and how we can kind of mitigate that. Yeah, um, great, great question. Um, so first of all, it's real. Like the, the chance of uh, burnout is bigger, I think, if you're remote. Uh, also because there's no natural, uh, natural barrier between work life and personal life because it's like, it tends to be the same space, you have flexibility in time. So the, it's very easy to kind of start working in the evening and things like that. So it's a... Uh, it's a problem. There's no one right answer. It's something on our, it's something we, we care about. Like uh, the top, the top um, talk at our last summit was Martin talking about burnout. Martin just got the only conditional bonus in the history of the company. Like you did a great job, Martin, but watch out, watch yourself. Um, burnout was a topic of conversation at our last executive meeting on Monday, that's yesterday. Um, so, it's certainly, we're all at risk for this um, and remote makes it harder. Um, there's, no, there's, there's a couple of sections about burnout in our handbook. I, I advise you to beat them. Um, the other question was around kind of benchmarking yourself with your peers. Uh, this is where your manager comes in. So your manager should be able to um, to help you there. So it's, it's a totally legitimate question to go to your manager and say, look, how am I doing? How am I doing compared to other people? What do you think of my results? What do you think of my output? That's why we give everyone a single manager and we make sure that the manager doesn't have too many reports. I think maybe Taylor and the BizOps project is kind of an exception where it's Taylor doesn't have, well, it's, it's, a, it's a bit more messy there than in the rest of the company. In the rest of the company, it's pretty functionally oriented. Your manager should understand what you do. You should be able to go there and it's, don't, don't be afraid to ask that question. I think, I think me, I've managed people. I love it when people ask that question. It's, it shows great, uh, it shows a great attitude. Um, and then if you're curious about what other people get done, look, don't forget it's GitLab. So you can just go to their profile in GitLab and watch their activity feed and get an idea for how many comments they do, how many merge requests they do, et cetera. But that's really more, okay, judging output is really more your manager's job. It should be that you can, can focus on your work and you don't have to look left and right what, your, what the other team members are doing. Hi, Sid. What has been GitLab's biggest mistake and what have you learned from it? Thanks, Suri. Um, there was one thing where we kind of uh, 
focused on something else. So I started GitLab with GitLab.com and I think this is going to be awesome. Now when I did the show Hacker News for that, someone said, there's already Bitbucket. They also have free private repos. And I just lost the biggest edge that I thought we had. Uh, so it took a year to realize that the demand was not for the SaaS service. The demand was really for the self-hosted service. So after a year, we, we kind of started focusing on that. That's been a big help. Now, the, the biggest uh, problem that we, we still suffer from is also that we, we kind of pivoted back too late. Or I won't call it a pivot, but we focused back too late on GitLab.com. I think uh, only now... Next quarter, GitLab's gonna, the com is gonna be ready for mission critical tasks. And in hindsight, I would have rather have that a year or two years ago. But it, it's, it, it's kind of, um, sometimes you overcorrect a bit. But that was a, a big change, figuring out where the market was. And I, I see the same thing with a lot of startups that they focus on SaaS and then they figure out that all the big companies are still self-hosted and they need to, and they need to address that. Thanks for that, Sid. Um, so I have a question particularly about design. So one of the challenges that we see in the industry sometimes is that technical startups that work with code related products have a challenge dealing with design. And I've just come in and I, I see a very healthy relationship between development and design. I'm, I'm a front end developer myself. How has that relationship started? What started design at GitLab, and how, how has it come to be what, are you, well, what it is now? Um, that's a great question. I think also we got lucky also with the people we hire, etc. Um, I also think that you know, look, co collaboration is our first value and, and people live that like it's, it's due to people being open to criticism and to feedback, but also having the strength to say, okay, we don't need consensus in the end. I, I do this. So first of all, everyone gets or everybody, but a lot of people in GitLab get the importance of design. Um, we had really bad design, uh, like two years back, people couldn't stop complaining about our navigation and it was horrible. Um, so we, we, we have a lot of pain. So we're really proud that right now, I think if you compare us to, to the competition, we have better, a better user experience than anybody else, despite like having a higher velocity of new features and despite having a broader scope for a single product. So I think that's an amazing achievement. And uh, I also think that our, our UX and, and, and front-end teams stick to like boring solutions. Um, and I'm very proud, like you see people, other companies get off the rails there. They, uh, they try to do something too interesting and it kind of holds everyone back. And uh, hopefully it's, it's also because it's, it's interesting. You have enough new features that you, you don't have to be bored and, and, and it's, it's just hard to keep up with the, with the fire hose that is, that is on already. Um, and uh, one thing I think we do well, and that's kind of in general in the company, we have this, uh, most, most companies have, if you have decision-making, you can do, most companies speak between two options. Either um, it's very hierarchical, top-down, or it's bottoms up. Top down, you miss kind of the good ideas. If it's bottom up and we all need consensus, that doesn't really work. So what you get is people will start doing things in secret. So they don't want to get they don't want to get bogged down by consensus. So they have secret projects. So so other people can stop them. Um, so both things don't really work. We choose, I think, the best of two worlds by splitting it, splitting, making, having, uh, acknowledging that it's two different things. First is like data gathering, there the bottoms up really work. Everyone can comment, everyone can contribute, everyone can, can have an opinion. Then the decision making process, what do we really do? It's just whoever does the work or their boss decides. Super easy, no need to build consensus. You might wanna leave a comment that you heard someone, but you don't have to convince them. It's, you do the work, you, you, you call the shots. And I think by combining it like that, I, I think the collaboration, uh, the cross-functional collaboration just gets easier in the company. In the end, if it's, if it's a front-end thing, the front-end decides. And uh, I, I think that gives a lot of security to open up for all the inevitable suggestions. 
Uh, okay, but um, as you go by iterating, uh, don't you encounter already some uh, people trying to iterate on an already discussed feature to try to uh, put the, a previous solution that was uh, rejected or something like that? I'm not sure I completely answered the question, so feel free to follow up, Olivier. But uh, I, I'm not afraid to kind of open up. It's okay to kind of try to open up an old conversation. So our process is um, disagree and uh, commit, or I'm not sure it's disagree and something. I think it's disagree and commit. So if we make a decision, you're sub everyone goes with that like you, you can't like not half do something because you don't agree with the decision but it's always okay almost at the same time to still be like okay but i i really think we should do it different and i gathered some more data and can you reconsider this some of the best decisions we've done including like adding gitlab ci to gitlab the the application is because people just kept bugging people about it and that is that is fine as long as at the same time, while you're working people to change the decision, you comply uh, with, the, with the decision that was made. So you, you do the work, you maintain two separate applications, but then Camille came to Dimitri and said, look, I really think we should integrate. And Dimitri kept saying, no, that's a, that's a weird idea. Like separate tools for separate tasks, like small tools that you compose. And then Dimitri agreed. And then Dimitri went to me and I said, no, 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 that's, that's a bad idea. And then, so, and then Dimitri kept going. So it's okay to keep droning on about something. It's, it's probably, if it keeps bothering you, it's, there's probably something there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, exactly. Hello, Sid. Uh, I was wondering, um, I'm, joining, I'm joining the UX design team. so. Uh, can you talk uh, so, uh, something about the monthly release schedule and the idea behind that? And do you think that uh, a, a, a slightly longer schedule would help in uh, shipping more features or uh, would be able to help in a longer design vision to yep. establish in the product? Thank you, too. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so it got established just because Dimitri released the first version on the 22nd. The next month he did the 22nd and he thought, well, let's keep this up. Um, as long as the company existed, um, so even, even during Y Combinator, uh, for example, you can talk to Valeri. Uh, he said, look, why can't we do a two month cycle? Like we'll have more time. We spend so much time right now with just the release process. Um, that would all be effective working time if we, uh, if we had a longer, a longer cycle. And there's a lot of people that do longer cycles. I think both like Chrome and Ember are on six week schedules. Uh, so those make sense. Um, if you look at GitLab, we ship in a month what our competition ships in about a year. So it's hard to argue with that. Like we, we, we get a lot of things done and the iteration is, is one of those secrets. Like, because you have so little time, you bite, you, you, you see the whole thing, but you have to bite off this super frustrating, super small thing that doesn't quite do what it should do. And that is extremely frustrating. It's like every, every applicant says, oh, I love iteration. I always think, oh, you don't, I know you say, you don't know what you're signing up for. Like this is iteration done properly is super painful. I hate it. I hate it myself. Like with the BizOps project, we had to reduce scope. And I was like almost ready to say like, well, we, we can at least say that we're going to do this in the future. And I thought, no, no, it's an iteration. Like keep it simple. And you can always expand from that. And that's extremely painful. So I, I get the, the want for a longer cycle, but, um, Biting off those small bits makes sure that we that that we that we can that we can oversee them, and we still like I would be open to making a longer release cycle when we ship exactly everything that we planned at the beginning of a release process. Right now we don't, so if anything, we should keep it make it shorter and go to go to every three weeks or every two weeks. I'll probably have Valeri and you being mad at me when I proposed that. Um, 
so th this is about the this is the consensus we got to like the 20 seconds it seems to work well so so we'll keep that but it's if you want to go faster take smaller steps and take them take them a lot faster um so that's that's why we're not lengthening the release cycle i think we'll bite off more we'll have a harder time swallowing it we'll have more things that don't ship in the release that we planned do, do you have the same um mentality and attitude towards um things that aren't features so either refactoring for performance or like test coverage or, or something like that um yeah. Yeah. Organ what do you think about organizational design handbook updates? Like, Oh, I updated 16 pages in the handbook and like, Oh no, what did you do? Like, keep it small. Like, I have a great new idea for this. Okay. What's the first step? How, how do we, how do we get there? So it applies cross-functionally. Okay. We've got a great new marketing idea. Well, do we build a whole campaign about it or are we first going to do a test event? Um, we're going to do a mailing about our ultimate promotion. I said, okay, well, can we just email the first 10% of people and see what their feedback is and what they, what questions they have and then improve the mailing for the rest. Seems super obvious, but if iteration is not, you really have to think about, oh, how do I iterate before you, before you do stuff like that? Is it? Um, I have a little bit of a fun question. Uh, what, would you, what, is the, uh, what would you say is the meaning behind and uh, the story uh, of the logo, the GitLab logo? So we, we had a, an old logo. If you've seen it, it's kind of a frowning fox looking pretty angry. We kind of said like the, the, as soon as we got more than 50% of the market, the, the, we'll make the fox smile. So, <laughs> so it's a smiling fox. Um, yes, the current one, I think the fox smiles, although there, there's no mouth there, uh, but it's a smiling fox. Um, the thing was that the old logo gave people nightmares. So two people <laughs> independently reported that they had bad dreams about the logo because you kind of see it the whole day that you're working with GitLab and it, it haunted them in their dreams. Thanks, Andre, for posting a, posting a link to the old logo. So we were like, okay, well, this is not good. And... Um, we, uh, we kind of wanted to ask the person that contributed the old logo for, for his blessing. His name is Ricardo Mars. And what happened is that at, at the high point of, 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 of our company to, up to that time, at the Y Combinator demo day, Ricardo Mars, the guy who contributed our logo, was in attendance as an investor. So he came up to us and Dimitri asked, like, sorry, but like your, your logo gives people nightmares. Is, is it okay if we change it? It's like, okay, of course. Uh, he says, I know just the person. This person is specialized in Fox logos. We're like, what? You have logo designers that are specialized in Fox logos, <laughs> but apparently that's a thing. And I, I think the, the person did a, a wonderful job. Although obviously this is a Tanuki, not a Fox, but. Uh, <laughs> but, but why the Fox or the Tanuki? Why the meaning behind it? Because uh, Ricardo Mars uh, made, made, made something that both looked like a raccoon and a fox. So we decided it was a tanuki. And uh, the <laughs> other part of the story is that uh, uh, tanukis or raccoon dogs, they, they, they collaborate. They're not oh. individually strong, but they are strong because they collaborate. So it's, GitLab is not strong because we're the best company in the world, although we are. But we have a superpower and that's collaborating with 1900 people on this and that's our superpower. Speaking of other companies, um, how often do you talk with um, maybe other CEOs or exec teams of remote only companies like Zapier or Elastic? And like, do you, do you get information from them or, you know, compare and contrast notes? Yeah, um, so uh, Matt Mullenweg, um, the CEO of Automatic, uh, makers of WordPress is on our board. I had like, lunch with him last week. Um, so we compare notes and there's some interesting idea about coaching that, that we might implement. Um, I talked to the person at Buffer. I talked to the people at Zapier. I talk with the people at HackerOne trying to give them some hints on remote work. So yeah, we do talk. 
with those not on a regular basis, but we do compare notes. I, and we try to kind of, if they have good ideas that we can implement, we, we, we certainly try to do that. So I think we're a bit further ahead than most companies in making this work. So reflecting on remote culture, um, do you think this is something that's infinitely scalable? Like, I think it works great now, but thinking about a time after we IPO someday and the company is 2000 people, do you think that uh, remote, a remote setup of working will, will work regardless of a company size? I think it actually works better at scale. So I think if you're seven people, probably remote is harder uh, because you can all be in a room together and there's, there's a certain vibe to that. I think as a company grows, you start having, first you had a room, now you have a floor, and then you have multiple floors, then you have multiple buildings. Like that whole benefit of being in the same room that, that greatly dilutes. With us, the benefit of like having documented processes and things like that, it accumulates. Like our values are better specified than any other company. Our communication structure is better specified than any other company. A real-time org chart, I've, I've not seen that in any other company. Like those things that, that, that kind of were a burden maybe at, at a company of 10 people, they start uh, accumulating. They get better as you scale. While the benefits of being on site start degrading as you scale because look, there's only so many people you can walk into in the hallway. So I think it actually gets better. So I think, I think every large company is a remote company anyway. They just they didn't acknowledge it and they didn't optimize for it. Also welcomes our questions about our values. We already talked about some, but questions are very welcome. Also about team structure and about how we work. Yeah, I have a question regarding uh, titles because I saw uh, in some teams, uh, people are called engineer, while in others are called developer. And I'm wondering what makes the difference I think it's uh, inconsistency. Uh, I don't think there's a big difference. It's, it's actually not true. I think in some places, um, Michael specifically on, on BizOps, he says he cannot be called an engineer um, because it's like against Canadian regulations. And so he has to be called a developer. But that, that also, yeah, chartered in, in some countries, engineers are chartered and he's, he's not. I think developer is better because it's specific, uh, more specific, so it, it relays more information. What's the value that you see most people or many people struggling with? Uh, thanks, Zoe. Great question. Uh, iteration. Iteration is by far the hardest. I think all the other things, people kind of have a feel for it. With iteration, people underestimate the, the magnitude. Like people underestimate how small of a change is already beneficial. Like you can see it like new hires, like they have these work in progress merge requests. And then first of all, it's it shouldn't be marked more work in progress because if you merge it, like stuff gets bad, like there's no downside to merging it. So it shouldn't be marked like that. And then second thing is they work too long on it. Like it's, it's, it's already beneficial. They should merge it and, and start a new one. No, no need to kind of drag it out over, over multiple days. Uh, and that's, that's not just in engineering, like that's also merge request to the handbook and other things. Um, it's just really uh, painful to do the minimal, the minimal next step, because you want to, everyone here wants to do a great job and they, they envision the future and then they have a vision of how oh, this is where we should go to. And they, a natural instinct is to kind of pack up the stuff to go to on this long hike towards the top there. And then that's not what we expect you to do. We, we expect you to just grab only a water bottle, walk out 
walk out for a few minutes and then set up camp there and then then, then work on something else before you continue and and just get a, get a lot done and and we think it's always really easy to plan for the field that's immediately in front of you and really hard to plan for like this this track up a mountain where you don't have a map so the, the way to get there is many small sprints uh, the analogy doesn't totally work but i it's by far but iteration is the hardest thing and i i struggle with that i think the the executive team struggles with that that i i think it's super it's super counterintuitive and, and very painful and also, and I sound a bit like a downer here. It's also amazingly effective. Like, look at what we what we're able to accomplish every month. So it works really well. Can I um, ask that you follow up on that work in progress merge request point that you made there? To, in some way, like top down to engineering managers, because I I agree with your point. Like, um, it's it's hugely beneficial to just be merging code the second it works. Um, and, and you get a whole bunch of extra benefits on top of this in terms of how comfortable people become with just making small improvements because they're quicker to get merged. Um, people refactor code quicker because it doesn't have a week long review cycle. Um, but, but the only kind of thing I want you to follow up on is that I, I don't think that's what's being communicated from engineering management or in the, um, review process, the whip merge request thing may be even, um, encouraged in the engineering, um, handbook as well as certainly I think that's basically how most of the engineering teams are working. So it'd be interesting to kind of follow up on that discussion and, and see where the, where the differences lie. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. I, I don't have an opinion on this. Um, I see the, I can see the with merge press request for engineering because there's kind of a, like there's a definition of done and things like that you want to avoid merging stuff with our documentation uh, you want to avoid doing a review and then everything you bring up the person says oh well i thought of that it's going to be added um so i think with engineering it's a lot about kind of keeping the scope small and and kind of the the release cycle helps with that like you can do that more than a, a couple of weeks of work um now it might be that it's beneficial to make it even smaller and I encourage you to kind of bring that up with your manager and, and, and be vocal about that. Um, I more mean the merge request kind of to the handbook, like that it's not code, it's not going to break anything. It's an improvement, like just get it, get it over with. Um, so that was my example, but it might be that in engineering, we're able to do smaller things too. Um, feel free to advocate for that. I had a question on the, um, the structure. So when I was looking at it, I saw that it looks like, I think it is it Job is the VP of product. Correct. And then there is a, there was Mark who had another section as head of product. How come those are broken out separately? Yep. Uh, we got two great product people. And I'm a bit of a product CEO, so it's something I uh, I care about, and something that like evolves really rapidly. If you if you see that we went from just source control like two two three years ago to to the whole DevOps life cycle now, I want to make sure I stay in in touch there. And we we got two people that are kind of competent on an equal level, so they they both both report directly to me. Nice, thank you. Thanks for the question, Christy. First time someone asked about that. So well done. It said, I have a question. It, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Luca first. Okay. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, I have a question. You, we I've heard kind of um talks and stuff about how where where we're gonna be within the next couple of years. Um, but where do you see GitLab being in like five years from now? like six, seven years from now? What, what are your kind of long-term goals for the company? Where do you see, see us being then? Yeah, so five years from now, 
that will be 2023. So we would have IPO'd three years ago. before that. We would be the default um, solution for like developing uh, software. So developing and operating software. Um, we wouldn't only have the most market share self-hosted, but also in SaaS. We'd be a couple of thousand people as an organization. We'd have more than 5,000 contributors. Um, we start making inroads beyond just software. Um, so the, the other part of our mission, everyone can contribute, not just to software, but to everything. We already have a substantial business in uh, data science uh, where people use a core of GitLab to, to be able to contribute to it. And we're, we're branching out on in other uh, markets like design, like bookmaking, uh, things like that. Maybe even movie editing. Um, at that point, uh, we start seeing the, the, the move from GitHub to GitLab for open source projects. Um, so the, the open source projects want the benefit of a single application for the, for all their development and operations needs. Um, yeah, that, those are the things that come to mind. Was that the direction you wanted to take it in? Yeah, I think so. That was, that's a good answer. Thank you. Um, do you, the a kind of question that's tacked onto that, uh, in terms of the amount of people that work for like the amount of employees, no, I think there's a goal to hire, I think it's a thousand employees by 2020, right? Is that, is that what I've heard? Um, I don't think that's a goal. I think we oh, want right. to do, we want to, we want to do our work with as few people as we can. But yeah, that was going to be my question is, um, is there like a limit on the amount of people that you, you kind of see the company needing or wanting, like, you know what I mean? I don't see a limit. Uh, how we, we're startup. We want to grow, we want to grow as fast as we can and we'll hire the people according to, to how many are needed to, to, to execute on that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Tony. Yeah, thanks. So mine, uh, be, being customer facing in my role uh, and working with uh, directors and, and higher up executives in the enterprise level, um, we talk a lot about functionality and our differentiators and, and, and how we're going to change the market. Um, so as we continue to add functionality, what are the goals with regards to ensuring success and, and having a long-term partnership uh, with our customers and, and making sure that they're not just uh, um, having success in the short term, but being with us for a long time? Yeah, I think if it, uh, we want that and we want a long-term partnership and make them successful over the long run. I think the, the partnership uh, should, as we evolve, it should be less about GitLab and it should be more about them achieving their goals. So instead of, hey, we're going to make you successful in using GitLab, it should be, no, we're going to make you a really well-run engineering organization. We're going to make you your DevOps life cycle three times faster and really partner with companies on that and help them achieve that. And that takes a lot of, and the first step is like quarterly business reviews with them, et cetera. But we, we wanna make sure that when people think about a well-run engineering organization, they think, okay, GitLab, GitLab can help there, not just with the software, but also the software should be a distillation of all the, all the best practices and we should be able to help transforming those organizations. Thank you. So just to follow up to that. So right now it's, it's really important for us uh, um, to continue to grow our, our market share um, and get those, uh, those new logos or those new customers. Um, so with regards to uh, what, what do you see as we, we talk a lot about functionality and features. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, talks right now about pricing, but it's definitely about value, right? Being able to do from idea to production, uh, the value of, of going with a GitLab solution uh, obviously is out there. So what do you see as the biggest obstacle or uh, what gets you frustrated about the sales team that you wanna see them start promoting a little bit more? Uh, in other words, instead of, for me, can you help me 
do some selling. What, what do you want to see me do uh, a better job of for you? Yeah. Um, well, I'm not frustrated with the sales team. I think they're doing an excellent job. But I, I think the challenge we have as a company, there's two challenges. First is the awareness. Not everybody knows about us yet. And it's slowly getting addressed. Yeah. And then the, the second challenge is people thinking of us as version control instead of a, a, a single application for the complete DevOps lifecycle. And uh, we want to address both things. And I, I think the salespeople, they come in when apparently there are some awareness. So they have a big role in, in, in sketching that vision and how they can understanding how they and articulating how we can help people being better run, how we can make organizations better, how we can make, enable a faster DevOps life cycle and then give specific examples there. So, okay, how can you do that? Because every vendor that comes by here has some version of that story. How can, what can I do with GitLab that I can do in other things? And articulating that I think is really powerful. Thank you. Cool. Thanks so much for the questions. This was really fun for me. Uh, you made it happen. And uh, welcome to GitLab. So glad you joined. Uh, if there's anything wrong, it's my fault. So feel free to direct message me on Slack or paste something in the CEO channel. Have a great time. Bye. Well, thanks, Sid. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sid. Thanks, Sid. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.